Chapter 10. Christianity. To define Christianity, one could hardly do better than use the words of Frederick W. Farrar, canon of Westminster and chaplain to Queen Victoria, who in 1874 wrote A Life of Christ. In his preface are the following lines. We study the sacred books of all the great religions of the world. We see the effect exercised by those religions on the mind of their votaries. And in spite of all the truths which even the worst of them enshrined, we watch the failure of them all to produce the ins inestim excuse me, inestimable blessings which we have ourselves enjoyed from infancy, which we treasure as dearly as our life, and which we regard as solely due to the spread and establishment of the Christian faith. We read the systems and treatises of ancient philosophy, and in spite of all the great and noble elements in which they abound, we see their total incapacity to, to console or support or deliver or regenerate the world. Then we see the light of Christianity dawning like a tender spring day amid the universal and intolerable darkness. From the first, that new religion allies itself with the world's utter feebleness and those feebleness it shares. Yet without wealth, without learning, without genius, without arms, without anything to dazzle and attract the religion of outcasts and exiles, of fugitives and prisoners. Numbering among, it, among its earliest converts, not many wise, not many noble, not many mighty, but such as the Gaylor of Philippi and the runaway slave of Coloss, with no blessing apparently upon it to save such a cometh from above, with no light whatever, about it, save the light that comes from heaven. It puts to flight kings in their armies. It breathes a new life, a new hope, and a new and unknown holiness into a guilty and decrepit world. This we see, and we see the work grow and increase and become more and more irresistible and spread with the gentleness of a sea that caresses the shore it covers. Words fail when attempting to speak of Jesus Christ, the founder of Christianity. His birth, life, and death are known to all. His teaching was public and accessible to the humblest. Long years of learning, awful initiation ceremonies, striking terror in the adept soul were not required from the followers of Christ. Himself, the bearer of that light in which he taught, was not to be found in man's earthy nature, but was to be sought from without. He invoked God with humble prayer and faith and performed all miracles. The reign is Christ's teaching diametrically opposed to that of high adepts, whose secret doctrine was that man had divinity in himself and could bring it out by exercise of will, by concentration of thought and scientific psychic development. Fear, the predominant feature attendant upon the gaining of knowledge and in all other religious systems was foreign to the adherents of Christ, who were repeatedly told, fear not, be not afraid. No bonds, no fetters were imposed by him in the shape of ritualism. Love of God and love of neighbor were the only precepts, faith and charity, and only the only means through which the divine spirit gave man transcendental power over moral evil and physical ills. No purer and simpler doctrine, no greater knowledge of the communi communion possible between God and man had ever been given. Yet, within a very short time after the death of Christ, Christian ritualism began to appear. A theological system of dogmas and beliefs was devised. Modes of worship elaborated and hierarchy arose with all its attendant evils. However, the Christian faith, under the lash of persecution, had shown the world the power of faith and charity. And against this power, the forces of evil have ever been unfurled. Blow after blow was dealt to the rising church. Both its beliefs and practices were attacked by those who professed other views and worshipped other gods and who designed all schemes to subvert and pervert Christianity. Henceforth, as it has ever been with all religions, the history of Christianity and of Gnosticism will develop side by side the perversion and destruction of the former being the aims of the latter. The tree of Christianity gave forth three main branches, the Catholic, Catholicism of Rome, 
Greek Catholicism and in the 21st century, Lutherism. Wait a minute, I'm sorry, in the 16th century, Lutherism. <laughs> <laughs> the two former bodies remained homogenous, but Lutherism gave birth to innumerable sects, all dissenting from the parent church. Chapter 11. Manichaeism. Manichaeism is the religion of the followers of Mainz, a slave who was sold to a widow who freed and adopted him, thus making him the son of the widow. A name which after him passed to all his followers and is still used in Masonic lodges. Of Manichaeism, C. W. Oliver, considered an authority on all Masonic matters, writes, Manichaeism was one of the most important attempts to found a universal religion and to reconcile the Christian, Buddhist, and Mesdain with the Greek philosophy. It presented the same syncretic ideas found later among Muslim Druzes and among Sikhs. It failed in the first place because Islam presented a much simpler system in the East, and because in the West Christianity was already developing in the time of Mainz, a religion which aimed at reconciling the paganism of Italy and Gaul with the ethics of Christ, this presenting a simpler and more familiar faith. But the one achievement of Mainz was the creation of the devil, which led to an afterwards unremovable taint throughout religion. Mainz was a noble philosopher and religious teacher born about the year A.D. 216, and he was crucified and flayed alive by the Persian Magi under Bahram I in the year A.D. 277. His Persian name was Shuraik rendered Kubricus in Latin. He was the slave of the wife of a certain Terebinth, who was a disciple of Scythianus, of the race of the Saracens. Oliver tells us further that his Acta Archdi became the Manichaean Bible with sundry added epistles. He taught the Mazdaean dualism of the powers of light and darkness as representing good and evil beings, and an asceticism which aimed at the control of all passions. Mainz repudiated Judaism and, like the Gnostics, regarded Jehovah as an evil god. The Manichaeans were more hated and feared by Catholic Christians than any other sect. They were still in existence in spite of the constant persecution as late as our 10th century, and their influence was felt from China to Spain and Gaul. It still lingers in Asia, and among the Christians of St. Thomas in Madras, it survived till the 15th century. But the Roman Empire felt the force of this system chiefly in A.D. 280. The Romans knew it themselves in A.D. 330, and Faustus became its missionary among them. Many clung to Manichaeism till A.D. 440, and Leo the Great found that he must stamp it out if the Roman creed was not to be extinguished. It was the basis of the Paulican hearsay, and of that the Abigensis of the south of France, which was only quenched by blood in the 13th century. The doctrine of Mainz can be summed up as follows. He believed in two gods, or more exactly, principles, the principle of good and that of evil. Before the creation of the world, the people of darkness revolted against the God, and God, incapable of withstanding the attack, gave them a portion of his essence. The people of darkness having within them the principle of evil by their very nature and the principle of good which they had just acquired were able to constitute the world were where both these principles are combined, but where the principle of evil predominates as a natural characteristic of its originators. Man is a mixture of two natures, the spiritual being, the work of God, the body, and especially sex, the work of the devil. Summers, another authority, further explains that 
it must be clearly borne in mind that these heretical bodies with their endless ramifications were not merely exponents of erroneous religious and intellectual beliefs by which they morally corrupted all who came under their influence but they were the avowed enemies of law and order red-hot anarchists who would stop at nothing to gain their ends terrorism and secret murder were their most frequent weapons the Manichaean system was in truth a simultaneous attack upon the church and the state, a desperate but well-planned organization to destroy the whole fabric of society, to reduce civilization to chaos. Manichaeism possessed its dogma, dogmas, liturgies, devotees, and churches. But again, to quote Oliver, First and foremost, among the manifestations of what had become devil worship, we find the black mass or devil masses of the Middle Ages, from which the ceremonial and ritual of black magic derived are derived. The principle which forms the very essence of the devil, the idea of opposition, also underlies the whole ceremonial and ritual of black magic and black masses such ideas as repeating prayers backwards reversing the cross consecrating obscene or filthy objects are typical of this sense of opposition or desecration which is also recognized form of mental disease the key word to the whole of the practices of black magic is desecration yet another authority not to be overlooked namely abby baruel author of memories poor savior <laughs> i'm gonna butcher this why can't they just say it in english de jacobinismus shows the remarkable analogy between the dogmas and rituals of freemasonry templarism and those of manichaeism grades concur in number and signs are identical the mourning for jacques molay is a ceremony analogous to the practice to that practiced by the Manichaeans in resemblance of Mainz and known as Bema. The term Mekbenek, still used in Masonic lodges, was the reminder of the execution of Mainz, which all Manichaean adepts sought to revenge. The practice of so-called fraternity or brotherhood was in Manichaeism extended only to adepts of the sect just as it is similarly practiced by Freemasons towards one another only. The question which naturally comes up to one's mind when one follows closely the links of the Manichaean chain is this. Is not Freemasonry such as we see it today, the full development of the idea of Kubrickus or Mainz, the slave, the apothesis of Manichaeism as achieved by Albert Pike, sovereign pontiff of the universal Freemasonry? Okay, we're going to go on. I'm going to take a drink first. Hold on a second. Sorry about the breakup. All right. Chapter 12, Witchcraft. Margaret Alice Murray, writing in the witch cult in Western Europe, establishes both the phallic and the religious character of the craft in her remarkable book, from which we extract part of the following valuable information. The deity worshipped by the witches was in some cases Lucifer, as the good god in opposition to Adonai, the Christian god, in his character of the benefactor of humanity, and in other instances Satan, the same spirit as the principle of evil. This is evident from the various references to their deity, adduced in the trials of persons accused of this hearsay. In both cases, however, the devotees, whether of Lucifer or Satan, were obliged formally to renounce Christ, the Holy Ghost, and the Christian God, before embracing the devil faith, which was the logical outgrowth of the Masdean Manichaean dualist doctrine of the double divinity. The god of the witches seems to have been generally represented either as the double-faced god, Janus, or the goat-headed Baphomet. <coughs> Excuse me. The latter variously modified, but usually bearing between the horns on its head the phallic emblem of light-hearted candle. Esoterically, this candle symbolized the sex force, or kundalini risen to the pineal gland. Cotton Matter stated that the witches form themselves after the manner of congregational churches, and M. A. Murray gives the following description of their leader. The chief or supreme head of each district was known to the recorders as the devil. Below him in each district, one or more officers, according to the size of the district, were appointed by a chief. 
The officers might be either men or women. Their duties were to arrange for meetings, to send out notices, to keep the record of the work done, to transact and the business of the community, and to present new members. Evidently, these persons also noted any likely convert and either themselves entered into negotiations or reported to the chief and then took action as opportunity served. At the Esbets, the officer appears to have taken command in the absence of the Grand Master. At the Sabbaths, the officers were merely heads of their own covens and were known as devils or spirits, though recognized as greatly inferior to the chief. The principal officer acted as clerk at the Sabbath and entered the witch's report in his book. If he were a priest or ordained minister, he often performed part of the religious service. But the devil himself always celebrated the Mass or sacrament. From Le Moine in La Tradition, published in 1892, we learn that the garter is the distinctive mark of the witch leader, for a woman shared this honor with the Grand Master, as the Grand Mistress in some cases occupied the office of deacon. Animal masks seem to have been a popular form of disguise adopted by the witches and wizards attending meetings, and in this custom is probably responsible for many of the stories of witch lycanthropy. Among other obscene and phallic witch rites was the Black Mass, celebrated by a renegade priest upon the naked body of the adept whose benefit it was performed. It symbolized the perversion of all the rites of the Catholic Church. Black candles instead of white and worded Inverted crosses, chalices containing the blood of newborn infants, sacrificed for ritual purposes, urine for holy water, all these were part of the paraphernalia needed, according to historians, to propitiate the prince of darkness and his retinue of minor devils. Besides evocations, casting of spells, and sex orgies, devil worship entailed such inanities as desecration of the hosts stolen from the Catholic churches and the kissing of the Grand Master, devil on the tail, or membrum viral. Only hosts consecrated in the Roman Catholic churches could serve for black mass purposes, as it was essential in order to achieve desecration that the miracle of transubstantiation should have taken place. The host had actually to be not merely to represent the body and blood of Christ. As regards the Black Mass, M. Emile Calais makes the following astute observation in La Prohibition le Occult. L'Occult. <laughs> One may wonder if it, it was not in order to canalize such an overflow of sacrilege that the Church in the Middle Ages tolerated the Feast of Fools, a last vestige of the Saturnalia of ancient Greece. Before the altar, Upon the communion table, writes C. Lenin, were spread pell-mell, grilled hogs puddings, sausages, playing cards, and dice. For perfumes, old shoe leather burned in incense burners. Even the text of the divine service becomes the butt of an interminable parody, a confused jumble of jests and nonsense, of grotesque elu... <laughs> oh, God, I don't even know this word... Aliases and Latin buffooneries, an indescribable charivari of cat calls, cries, and whistles, etc. A few days afterwards, the church, purged of all these impurities, washed and cleaned, resumed its usual appearance. God again became master of his altar. The flood of human folly had passed. In 1484, Pope Innocent VIII issued a bull against the craft cou uh, couched in the following terms. It has come to our ears that numbers of both sexes do not avoid to have intercourse with demons, incubi and succubi, and that by their sorceries and by their incantations, charms, or conjurations, they suffocate, extinguish, and cause to perish the births of women, the increase of animals, the corn of the ground, the grapes of the vineyard, and the fruit of the trees, as well as men, women, flocks, herds, and other various kinds of animals, vines, apple trees, grass, corn, and other fruits of the earth, making and procuring that men and women, flocks and herds, and other animals shall suffer and be tormented both from within and without, so that men beget not nor women conceive, and they impede the conjugal action of men and women. Eliphas Levi, in Historia de la Mag Magi, gives the following explanation 
of the supposed origin of elements known as spiritists as dwellers on the threshold she states that according to the best authorities these spirits larves possess an ethereal body formed of the vapor of blood that is why thus they seek blood and why they were supposed formerly to feed on the smoke of sacrifices they are incubi or succubi the monstrous children of impure dreams when sufficiently condensed to be visible, they are only vapor colored by the reflection of a picture and have no independent life. They imitate the life of him who evokes them as the shadow does the body. They generally manifest around the persons of idiots and beings devoid of morality whose isolation has led them to develop, develop irregular habits. <clears throat> <laughs> Owing to the feeble cohesion of the parts of their fantastic bodies, they fear the open air, fire, and above all, the point of swords, and as they live only by the life of those who have created or evoked them, they become the va vaporous appendices of the real body of their parents. So it can happen that an injury inflicted on them might actually react upon the parent body, as the unborn child is really wounded or disfigured by an impression made upon its mother. These elements draw the vital heat from persons in good health and quickly exhaust those who are weak. They are the source of the stories of vampires, stories only too true and periodically recurrent, as everyone knows. That is why one feeds a chill. Excuse me, I have to reread that. That is why one feels a chill of the atmosphere when approaching mediums who are persons obsessed by these spirits that never manifest in the presence of anyone able to unveil the mystery of their monstrous birth. They are children of an exalted imagination or unbalanced mentality. In politics throughout the ages, witchcraft has practiced by subversive sects has played a prominent part. Illustrations of this are to be found in the case of the North Berwick witches who were tried for treason in 1592 when their devil or grand master francis stuart earl of bothwell attempted to supplant james the sixth as king of scotland oh i'm sorry the black masses held by the infamous abbey Gruberg of for madame de montespan with the object of regaining for her the favor of louis the 14th are famous in history Eliphas Levi, the great initiate, has thus defined the aims of magic and witchcraft. To deceive the peoples for the purpose of exploiting them, to enslave them and delay their progress, or prevent it even possible, such as the crime of black magic. Proof of the foregoing devil worship and contact with spirits or devils is found in history, even as late as 1819 when we read that the devil met Margaret Nin Gilbert, etc., studying the history of the Mopsis, in 1761, we find its grandmasters, grandmistresses, and deacons adorned with the distinctive garter of the witch, performed the ceremonial of kissing of the devil's tail as part of the ritual of the 18th century masonry. The coven of the Middle Ages is the Masonic Lodge of today, but the craft remains the craft. <clears throat> 